welcome everybody to Grand Rounds. It's 8 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, our first presenter today is Wyatt Messenger. He is a fellow of Dr. Ambodi's. He went to medical school at OHSU and is originally from Portland. And today he's going to be presenting on comp and boron in novel treatment for CRM. Dr. Messenger. So thanks, Russell, for the introduction. So it's a privilege to be here at the Moran. Um, it's been great working with Dr. Embody this past three months. Um, and I've, it's been great to get to know a lot of you guys. Look forward to meeting the rest of you um, as the year progresses. So like Russell said, my topic is uh, Compange 1. Um, it's a treatment for uh, CREO. Uh, before we get started in the Compange 1, I'd like to talk a little bit about the anatomy um, and the blood supply of the retina. The retina is supplied by two main vessels. The first vessel is the um, posterior ciliary artery, which supplies the sclera, choroid, and, um, and all the way up to the photoreceptors. Um, and the second ves main vessel is the central retinal artery, which pierces the optic nerve, travels through the optic nerve, the lamina cribosa, and then becomes the, the arcuate arteries once it enter enters the retina. So CRO generally presents um, with monocular vision loss. It's painless, um, and it's uh, there's, but there's actually three different types of CRAO. Um, even though we normally talk about the non neurotic type, which is the most common, um, and this is from um, atherosclerotic disease, um, embolus, thrombus. It can also be from trauma as well. In younger patients, it can also patients it can also be from a hematologic causes um, um, or systemic or uh, collagen vascular diseases as well. It presents with a cherry red spot, which is the classical presentation of, of CRAO. Uh, what you see in the cherry red spot is the kind of the whitening of the ganglion cell layer from edema from, um, from where the ganglion cell layer has died. And it's contrasted with the fovea, which doesn't have ganglion cells, and so the pigment is retained. You get that contrast of the, the cherry red compared to the surrounding retina. Uh, on fluorescein angiography, there's a normal choroidal filling, um, but the, there's delayed intraretinal um, filling. And this is due to, to the reason, th to the fact that the central retinal artery supplies the intraretinal intra vessels and then the posterior choroidal vessels supply, um, or the posterior ciliary vessels supply the choroid. And so it looks something like this. So as you can see here, the choroid is already filled um, as with, with kind of that white background. And then you get kind of a, w with inside the intraretinal vessels, you get a, a wave front where you see um, the, the dye or the fluorescein um, entering the vessels, and you actually see the leading edge of that of that front, and that's uh, really specific for uh, a, a CRAO, a non-arteritic CRAO. The second type is uh, um, is arteritic, and this is from giant cell arteritis. Uh, giant cell arteritis affects it's a, um, a a vasculitis affecting medium-sized vessels, so it also affects the posterior ciliary artery, and so you get optic nerve pathology as well. And so you can see the optic nerve here um, has edema, you can get cotton wool spots, sometimes hemorrhage hemorrhages. Um, and on FA, it reflects that the, the, um, the PCA and the, CR, the, the central retinal artery is occluded, and so you get delayed filling of both the choroidal vasculature and the intraretinal um, arteries. The last type of CRO is a transient arteritic uh, CRO, and th this is from um, multiple different um, causes. You can get a transient embolus that, that um, passes through the intraretinal vessels, um, and then by the time the patient presents, it's already gone, and so um, um, you don't actually see the, the, the embolus. Uh, hypotension can also be a cause, so uh, a lot of patients take blood pressure medications at night, so they get hypotensive at night when they're, um, and they're not, they're not symptomatic, but when they wake up, they have, um, they've, they've had decreased perfusion of the retinal vessels and can have um, a central retinal artery. It's not an occlusion, but it presents similar to a CRO. Um, and then vasospasm is another cause. The presentation is variable, but, um, and then there's uh, often normal uh, filling of the e of, uh, on fluorescein angiography because the, the vessels are patent by the time they present. Um, and then going forward, we're going to be talking about non arteritic So everything from here on out is regarding non arteritic um, CRO. So CRO is relatively rare. It presents about 1 in 10,000 visits to the ophthalmologist. Um, and so it's um, the true incidence isn't fully known because it's, it's um, fairly rare. It's more common in men than women, like 55 to 45. Um, and then the, the general age that it presents is in the mid-60s, and this is just because um, it's a reflection of that's when patients with atherosclerotic disease uh, present. It's almost exclusively monocular, but there are a few cases where it is bilateral. Um, and then the vision prognosis is really poor. So when they present, they usually present with count fingers to light perception. Some patients um, will maybe will get up to 2,400 um, 
in this, in the, for the majority of patients will get up to maybe 2,400, but there's a subset of about 10% 10, 10 of patients that will do better, and this is because they have a ciliary retinal artery um, that is not linked with a central retinal artery. And so in that subgroup of, of patients, about five or 10%, they'll, they will get visual acuity of about 20, 50 or better. And so um, I put a picture of this, this monkey up here. This is the rusus monkey. This is a mo the model they use. Dr. S uh, Hira from the University of Iowa is kind of a pioneer in a lot of the CRO studies. And uh, this monkey was used as the model for a lot of the, the, a lot of the treatments that we now have for CRO. And what he, dis Dr. S Hira discovered was that after 105 minutes, this, the retina suffers irreversible damage, and at 240 minutes, the damage is, is massive and catastrophic. And so there are several treatments for, for CRO. There's conservative and there's invasive treatments. Uh, the, um, going through the conservative uh, treatments, ocular massage has been used for several years, the idea being that when you massage the eye, you can actually dilate the interretinal vessels, move the embolus more distally, and preserve uh, the proximal tissue. Carbogen is a mixture of carbon dioxide and oxygen. It's about 5% carbon dioxide and 95% oxygen. The carbon dioxide bi dilates intracerebral and intraretinal vessels. Hyperbaric oxygen uh, and systemic vasodilators make sense. You bring oxygen and you're, you're dilating the intraretinal vessels. Uh, pentoxifilin is actually uh, similar to theophylline, where it's an adenosine um, agonist. And um, again, this also dilates intraretinal vessels. Enhanced external counterpulsation is something that was tried about ten, 10 years ago, and I hadn't before before um, researching this topic. I'd never heard of this before. But what they do is they inject about 500 milliliters of, of, of fluid, um, and then they put blood pressure cuffs on the patient's arms and legs, and d and the blood pressure cuffs constrict during diastole, um, moving the blood from the legs and the extremities to the organs and to the brain, and it's been shown to increase cerebral uh, uh, perfusion. And lastly, the IOP reducing drugs. The invasive techniques are anterior chamber paracentesis, where they pull some aqueous, uh, aqueous humor um, off of the, the anterior chamber, reducing intraocular pressure and allowing perfusion. And then um, local intraarterial uh, fibrinolysis has also um, been tried, obviously, this like PPA or septokinase. The problem with these treatments is that it's really hard to randomize these patients and also catch them in time um, to have a large enough sample size to have two different um, to, to have two different uh, different uh, wings in your study, and so this is this has kind of been the result. So ocular massage does have indirect evidence, um, but has never been shown to actually improve visual acuity in a randomized trial. Carbogen and hyper hyperbaric oxygen, as well as anterior chamber paracentesis, has actually failed in, in clinical trials. Systemic vasodilators, pentoxifilin, and enhanced external counterpulsation, like ocular massage, has indirect evidence that it increases intraretinal perfusion but there's no evidence that actually increases visual acuity. The most controversial is local intraarterial uh, fibrinolysis. So this is like injecting TPA or streptokinos, streptokinase into the supraorbital artery um, or, um, or the um, retrobulbar retrobulbarly to, to um, break up the clot. Um, however, this is the one area that does have, the, the, this is the only randomized clinical trial on this topic, and it was from the EAGLE trial that was done in Europe um, about 10 years ago, and what they found was there was no difference between the two tr treatment arms. They had about 40 patients in, in both arms, and uh, TPA did not uh, make a, a difference. Uh, but there are some retrospective studies that have shown some difference. And so the Cochrane Review um, that was done on this topic kind of reiterates this, this, this notion and says there, there's currently not enough evidence to decide which, if any, interventions for acute non-arteritic uh, central, central retinal artery occlusion would result in any beneficial or harmful effect. So that brings us to our treatment, angiopoietin-1. So angiopoietin-1 um, is, a, is a molecule that's constituently um, released by parasites to endothelial cells where it binds the TIE2 receptor on endothelial cells and stimulates blood vessel stabil stabilization via VE cadherin, which is a molecule that binds endothelial cells together. Um, about a year ago, Judd Cahoon, who's an MD-PhD in our lab, came in and spoke about, about our molecule here, compang one or angiopoietin-1. Um, and he, he, his model was in a chronic disease state. Well, we're, we're now going to flip it to and look at an acute model and see whether or not it works. And our molecule specifically is compang one, and the comp part is called is um, stands for cartil cartilage oligomatrix protein. And what the function of this is that we bind it to comp to the, the ang one, and it makes it more stable, soluble, and potent. 
Because if you inject AND1 directly into the, into the vitreous, it precipitates and never gets absorbed by the retinal cells. And interestingly, th they've used compand one in stroke models with, with rats. And they will, there's been studies where they've occluded the, the middle cerebral artery um, and then looked at stroke volume. And compand one has actually reduced stroke volume, um, attenuated neurologic deficits, and increased viable uh, neuronal mass. So how do we achieve this, the central retinal artery occlusion in a mouse? We inject something called rose van Gaal, which is a solution that's um, normally liquid that can be photoactivated where it solidifies. And so we inject it through a tail vein injection. It, it be becomes absorbed and, it, and um, enters, enters the, all the vasculature. And then we shoot a laser at the optic disc and, and si simulate a central retinal artery occlusion where it coagulates and um, the, the blood is, um, or the vessel is occluded. We have four different treatment groups. Um, the first group is compang one protein, which we inject intravitreally at 15 minutes following CRAO and at one week following CRAO. The second is adeno-associated virus um, compang one. And this is a virus that we inject into the, the vitreous. It gets incorporated into the cells and the cells themselves make um, compang one. And we can actually test this and we can measure the levels and, um, and um, we can find that compang one is produced by these cells. And this is, this is injected one week prior to CRAO. The last two treatment arms are, are controlled. So PBS is a salt solution, almost like PSS, um, where it's in injected into the, into the vitreous to simulate an, an intravitreal injection. The fourth group um, is uh, adenosocyte virus GFP, where GFP is actually made by the viral cells. This is a control for the, the adenosocyte virus compound one group. Right, right. These, these, are, these are all different. They, they only receive one treatment. They receive either um, one of these four arms. They don't receive, they don't receive both. So after CRO, we, um, we, took, we did fluorescein angiography to confirm that we actually occluded the vessel. And you can see baseline here is before CRO. And then at six hours and 24 hours, you can see vascular leakage um, just to confirm and, and, and impaired um, intraretinal vessel um, perfusion. And that's just to confirm that we actually did the, this, the Rose Bengal actually did the job and included the vessel. So if we look at our path, um, uh, there's some market, market changes. So we have normal on the left, PBS or control in the middle, and then compang one over um, on the right. And so remember that the central retinal artery supplies the inner retina. And so um, you can see that there's, in the PBS group, there's ganglion cell loss, there's the inner plexiform um, layer and the inner nuclear layer. There's vacuolization, there's pleomorphism, there's complete disorganization of the internuclear layer compared to compang one. Um, and even the thickness itself um, is, is, is much reduced um, compared to the compang one. And the compang one, I mean, even <coughs> just appears to look more like the normal. And this was taken at 10 days following CRO. So we wanted to know is there, are there metabolic differences between the, the compang one group and the control group? And so what we did is we used the comp computational molecular phenotyping, which was developed here by the Mark Lab. And what we do is we, we probe 12 different micromolecules anywhere between, um, the, these can be amino acids, neurotransmitters, or even markers for spe specific cell types in the retina. Um, and, and we get 12 different pictures, and then we overlay them and colorize them. And, base and we get these really colorful pictures with different cell types that we can actually identify the different cell types, and then we can quantify different metabolic characteristics of these, of these cells. And so this is a really busy slide, but I'll walk you, walk you through it. There's um, three different treatment groups um, by row. There's normal, PBS, which are again is our control, and then compang one on the third, the third row. The first column is a picture of what this actually looks like when we, when we put these images together. And right away, you can notice that the PBS group has complete loss of the inner, the, um, inner retina. And this was taken at six weeks. So there's the, at this point, the inner retina has actually had time to, to, um, to shrink down um, compared to the last slides that we saw, which were at 10 days. And another finding that you can kind of sticks out in this first column is that you can see the ganglion cell layer um, is much greener in the, the compang one group compared to normal. And so in the last two columns, we actually quantify this difference. And so we can actually measure how much, um, the green stands for glutathione, um, and we can actually quantify this difference. So when we look at glutathione levels, um, and these markers are actually really specific. So we have we, we probably identify about 15 different cell types, and all of them are within, are 
like almost right on top of each other, these different columns. And so this difference is actually significant. Um, and you can see an increase in glutathione levels in the Mueller NP of, of, um, of the CompAngE1 retinas. And we look at Mueller cells, the interest is in Mueller cells because this, they play a, a supportive role during ischemia um, um, in the retina. So this is all well and good. Like we have these, these great slides that show the, the loss of the inner retina um, in the PBS group and it's preserved in the CompAngE1 group. But ultimately all that really matters is function. And so to test function in, in mice, we put them in this box um, and we, we trigger their oculocephalic reflex where you put them on this pedestal here and we can actually, we rotate these, these columns around and you can actually watch the mouse track these columns. And we, um, as the mouse, we can watch this and we, t we titrate the size of the, of the column to the, to the mouse's ab um, ability to see the column. And so we can actually um, make these columns progressively smaller and smaller. And it looks something like this when, when, they, when they begin tracking. <coughs> and you can see the mouse, as I, he's tracking the, the different columns as they move around. And this is what we found after we did followed them for five weeks with baseline being before central retinal artery occlusion. Um, zero is actually at 24 hours and then we followed them out for five weeks. So in the GFP and the PBS controls, there was a, um, maybe a little bit of a function that was retained in some of the, some of the mice. But in the CompAngE1 virus and the CompAngE1 um, protein, there was a significant inc increase in, um, in, uh, in function um, in those two groups. So that kind of leads us to where we're at right now um, with this study. Um, we have several ongoing projects though with the study. We were looking at, at markers for cell proliferation to see if um, ret retinas are treated with CompAngE1 or um, mice are treated with CompAngE1 do have more markers for cell proliferation compared to controls. Um, we're also looking at mechanisms for neuroprotection. So glutathione levels are increased and we don't, um, right now it hasn't been elucidated how CompAngE1 may be increasing glutathione levels. So we're looking into that. Um, closer. We're also going to be using um, transgenic mice from the Tian lab, Dr. Tian's lab, um, um, looking at re retinal ganglion cell density and survival um, to actually quantify this difference. But probably the I most interesting part of, of all of our future directions is the idea of um, how we're getting retaining function. Um, all the other treatments for, for CRO have focused on reperfusion, breaking up the clot, dilating the interretinal vessels. Um, reperfusing, almost like the stroke model, where we, we, we try to bring oxygen as quickly back to the retina as, as possible. But CompAngE 1 doesn't act that way. It doesn't really act that way. We'd, we're not trying to reperfuse the retina. I mean, it does, it does stabilize retinal, um, intraretinal vessels on the field cells, but it doesn't break up the clot or, or focus on reperfusion. So it raises this interesting question. Do mammalian Mueller cells have stem cell potential? So there was a, there was a, a study done um, about uh, 15 years ago in zebrafish where they showed that Mueller cells can actually turn it, can actually become photoreceptors in zebrafish. Um, so the pink is stained for, for photoreceptors over here to the, to the right and the green is Mueller cells. And what they did is they lasered the, the retinas of these Mueller fish and they found that these Mueller cells actually turned into photoreceptors, um, suggesting that they have stem cell potential. And this has never been shown in mammalian um, cells, despite a lot of efforts. Um, but it does raise an interesting question of what, how endothelial cells could be impacting this. So um, 10 years ago, there was a, a, a major paper in Science that showed that endothelial cells, when cultured with uh, neuronal stem cells, uh, increased neurogenesis. They, uh, they, uh, uh, there were way, uh, several more neurons, or the, quanti the quantity of neurons grew um, much more in the, the, the cultures with endothelial cells versus the, the neuronal cells on their own. Um, and it suggests that endothelial cells may be playing a role and a, su a supportive role in neuro, um, neurogenesis. And so that brings us to our project. Um, so we have a marker for M, so MCM6 is a marker for a neurogen uh, or progen neural uh, progenitor marker and then tomato red is a marker for Mueller cells. And what we did is we overlaid the two to get the green and the red would make yellow. Um, and by overlaying the two, we could actually get a sense for whether or not tomato red cells or the, the Mueller red cells were becoming neuroprogenitors. And what we found is there's significantly more yellow in the overlay of the CRL group compared to, contr to control. And so in conclusion, um, 
um, we, we kind of have four major findings. Complange 1 preserves interretinal structure in hypoxic controls, um, in, in, hypo in hypoxic compared to controls. Complange 1 increases glutathione levels in Mueller and NP cells. Um, and, and glutathione, again, has, has a, it's a reactive oxygen sequestrant, so it could be playing a, um, a role in neuroprotection. Complange 1 improves optokinetic tracking following CRO. Ultimately, this is the most important marker because function is, is the, what we're all aiming for. And finally, Compange 1 may induce Mueller cells to dedifferentiate into other um, cell types. And again, this is, this is something that's still kind of speculative, but, um, but could be a really uh, fascinating finding of, of, our, of our study. Just a few acknowledgments um, quickly. So Dr. Ambadi, for just his leadership, his leadership in, this, in this study, um, he's kind of been the, the brains behind a lot of this. Uh, Dr. Uh, or Felix uh, Vasquez from the Mark Lab, He's been a tremendous help um, with helping with computational molecular phenotyping and teaching me that technique. The Mark Lab in general has donated their supplies and, and time um, to this project. And lastly, Jed Cahoon, who started this project um, with his uh, diabetic retinopathy mice um, and kind of got the, this project started. So here are my references. I got married three weeks ago, so I had to put a picture of my, my bride up there. <laughs> any, any questions? Yes. Yeah, it's a, gr it's a great question. So um, there's different ways to, to, to make a CRO in a mouse. Um, we, we're using the Rose Van Gaal technique. It probably lasts about, um, we're not sure entirely how long it lasts. Um, we have done FA at 24 hours, three weeks, and six weeks. And about three weeks, the they, this FA start looking relatively normal. And at six weeks, they're almost, I mean, they almo almost look normal, completely normal again. So um, we, uh, we are planning to do more FAs to, con to confirm um, that um, these models aren't, aren't perfect. The other model that they use, that Dr. Hyra has used, is like a glaucoma model where they increase intraocular pressure to the point that there's no perfusion of the, of the retina. Um, um, but Rose Van Gaal has been used, and it's a pretty standard, uh, it's a pretty standard method to, that's been used for CRO and other models. For sure. So the, the protein is given at um, 15 minutes afterwards and then at one week after. It's a retreatment at one week. And so obviously the protein is the, the clinically viable treatment because we can't pre-treat someone for a CRIO. Um, and so uh, mostly st it, the difficulty is trying to find a patient. And I mean, you would never find a patient 15 minutes after a CRIO. You'd find them at probably 12 hours most likely or 24 hours. And so eventually if this is going to become more clinically relevant, we're going to probably move back the first treatment to about 12 hours to see if it still preserves. But again, um, I mean, we're not reperfusing the retina, so if, if this is truly working by neurogenesis, um, then, then potentially the, the timing won't be quite as critical as like the TPA trials. <laughs> yeah. It seems like many of the field RIO or MOLA has this other benefit than the main dropping the flow, having a little bit of air gas to get the eye out. Well, the, the Rose Bay and Gaul should be blocking the, the flow at the optic, uh, right around the optic nerve, which is simula simulates, I mean, most embolisms lodge in the lamina nacrobosa, and so it simulates um, a CRO at that spot. Well, we're. I mean, I mean, if the embolus, the embolus will eventually, it will eventually recede and eventually flow will return. Um, and our model is not necessarily trying to reperfuse right away, but it's it might be working by, like I said, through neurogenesis and not actually by reperfusing the, the the 
interretinal vasculature. Am I, am I answering your question? Yeah, and it, I, I mean, in a, as long as there's reperf if there's reperfusion, eventually, so the the hematologic uh, a clot will eventually break up, and there will be reperfusion, not necessarily and a cal calci like a calcified um, embolus might not break up, but some of these will probably will break up, and there will be a, a normal a semi normal FA um, if um, at long term. Dr. Warner. Talking about for the histology or the, so um, that's a great, a great question. I, I didn't put both up there, but we actually I can go back. Um, so, yeah. So this is the vi so this is the virus right here at six at six weeks. This is the protein at ten days. So we are just about ready to harvest the protein at six weeks. So I don't have those pictures yet. Um, and then we we have the virus at six weeks, so so both are, are both are con are match up. I mean, both are show preservation. Um, so partly it's because um, mechanistically, like how can we explain how can we explain this? Um, both the stroke, the stroke model, and also how can we explain um, th this this preservation, um, and uh, and then we also. Yeah, understandably, and we're and we're going to be we're looking at we're going to using like SOX two and some other markers for neurogenesis, and and in that one overlay that I showed, um, there w there was an increase in in MCM six and in those in those Mueller cells. So, um, the ultimately though, um, I mean to preserve, we're trying to find mechanisms to explain function re re being retained too, um, in light of um, in light of conference one not really preserving perfusion. Thank you, Wyatt. Just a quick announcement, and that was ethnic. So just a reminder, Herbert Fred, who is from UT Health Science Center, will be having a special lecture here on Friday from 7 to 8. So we encourage you to attend if you are available. Uh, the next presenter is Ruju Rai. She is coming to us from the University of Boston and is originally from Chicago. She's actually going to be presenting on demyelinating.